Um, welcome everyone uh, to this launch event co-hosted by Friends of the Earth Scotland, Oil Change International and Platform. This evening we're very excited to be presenting uh, the findings and recommendations of an important report that we published in uh, May this year that our three organisations co-published. It's called Sea Change, Climate Emergency, Jobs and Managing the Phase-Out of UK Oil and Gas Extraction. So I'm Mary Church, I'm Head of Campaigns at Friends of the Earth Scotland and I'm your Chair for this event. So first, a few words of context uh, from, from me. Um, we are in the middle of a climate emergency, so we're not facing one, we're in the middle of one and that much has been apparent for many years now, particularly to communities on the front line of the impacts of climate change, mostly in the Global South. The IPCC's stark warning last year of how little time we have left to avoid breaching the very dangerous threshold of 1.5 degrees warming, the renewal of the climate movement with the emergence of the youth climate strikers and Extinction Rebellion has seen climate change rising up the political agenda at long last and announcements of climate emergency by the UK Parliament and the Scottish Government earlier this year signify um, that. So, in announcing a climate emergency, the Scottish Government pledged to put that focus at the heart of its programme for government and its spending review this year. And while there are many welcome measures in this year's uh, programme for government, so published just last week, the reality is that it still falls very far short of an adequate response to the scale and depth of the crisis that we are in. And the elephant in the room, of course, is North Sea oil and gas. So if we fail to address the question of phasing out extraction of oil and gas, then we are failing to address the climate emergency. And while, interestingly, for the first time, the Scottish Government's support for oil and gas is conditional, it's conditional on the sector's actions to ensure a sustainable energy transition, which sounds very good, uh, there is an inherent contradiction in the Government's statement, which still pledges support not just for production, but for continued exploration of uh, oil and gas in the North Sea. And there is nothing sustainable about going after ever more fossil fuels. And you'll hear more on this from Greg shortly, as this is a key focus of, of our sea change report. So the other key focus of our report is on just transition. Now, just transition is a term that's gaining a lot of political traction in the last few years, with the imperative for a just transition enshrined in the Paris Agreement. And in Scotland, we're one of the first countries in the world to establish a wide-reaching Just Transition Commission. This is something that Friends of the Air Scotland, with our trade union allies in the Just Transition Partnership, called for back in 2017, and we were very pleased to see that implemented by the Scottish Government. But Just Transition, of course, it's an idea that comes from the trade union movement. It's envisaged as a means of helping particularly industrial workers embrace the change that's necessitated by responding to environmental crises. And for Friends of the Earth, for oil change, for platform, it's an essential part of the response to the climate crisis. And Anna will say more about what this means in, in practice in terms of phasing out North Sea oil and gas extraction in a way that protects workers and the communities currently dependent on that industry. But I want to highlight one thing that just transition as a response to climate emergency has to involve. So the very idea of a, of a transition, just or otherwise, is that it takes place over a certain amount of time. And clearly for a transition to be just, it must involve processes and negotiations that involve the various stakeholders, particularly workers and communities. But climate science has given us the time frame over which that transition needs to happen. And it's basically the next decade, which is more than enough to get this right. So if there's the political will to do it, we can do this, but we must set a date for ending extraction of North Sea oil and gas. Greg will be followed by Anna Markova, campaigner at Platform. Platform is a London-based organisation that conducts research, education and campaigns for a just future beyond fossil fuels. And Anna is going to talk about the impacts of phasing out oil and gas on the workforce, scenarios for job creation in clean energy, policies needed to, to secure those jobs and safeguards uh, to ensure a just transition. I'm going to hand over to Anna now. <laughs>
Thank you, Greg. Uh, thanks for switching the slides. Um, so as others have said, I will focus much more on uh, the impacts of a managed phase out uh, of oil and gas drilling um, on the workforce and on how we can uh, get on a pathway to actually replacing the economic contribution of the oil and gas um, industry, replacing those jobs and making sure that there is a just transition for uh, the existing oil and gas workforce. Um, so before I kind of start with our research, I think it's important to recognise uh, that the North Sea oil and gas workforce is a workforce already under a lot of pressure. Uh, so since the downturn in oil prices from uh, starting in 2014, kind of dropping quite sharply to 2016, um, the oil and gas companies have been implementing lots of cost-cutting measures um, and the uh, trade union RMT um, has estimated that the staffing levels of uh, North Sea oil and gas uh, rigs um, have fallen by about 20% and people are having to work um, something like 300 hours more uh, for the same pay every year um, since 2014 because of these measures. Um, so, so, so think about that. Remember that the, the workforce is already squeezed and uh, there are, in the context of these um, kind of efforts to cut costs, um, uh, oil and gas companies are also thinking about uh, doing things like fully uh, automated uh, drilling. So um, it's estimated that it, by about 2025, there will be oil rigs that essentially just operate um, by themselves without anyone actually staffing them on site. Um, so there is already a, a huge pressure and, and a loss of jobs. At the same time, um, as people will, I'm sure, be aware, uh, the oil and gas industry has quite strong trade union representation and uh, it, particularly jobs that are direct rather than in the supply chain are well unionized and well paid. So, uh, so it's important to bear that in mind when we think about um, kind of how they compare to other industries. So if I go back for a second to that uh, graph, which in, in here has come out in very different colours, uh, <laughs> but, but it's the same graph as Greg just showed you of the um, managed phase out of um, uh, oil and gas over time. So the, so the kind of uh, darker, on here almost black, but really grey um, uh, area is the, um, is the, the, decline in already existing, already extracting oil and gas fields, and the red slash pink is the fields that haven't been opened up yet. Um, so if we're, what we're talking about as a, as a starting point for a um, kind of Paris compliant uh, phase out of oil and gas drilling, um, if what we're talking about is the, the kind of darker portion at the bottom phasing out, then we need to understand that also means a comparable, though not exactly the same shape of uh, decline in jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, partly the reason why it's not exactly the same is because actually uh, jobs and decommissioning, uh, depending on how that that sector is organised um, and how how those contracts are handed out, uh, will bring it um, up somewhat. Um, and there's more information on that in here, but I won't I won't go into that now. Um, but so that's the that's kind of the background, the loss of um, jobs over time, the decline of jobs over time is real. Um, and we have to think about uh, what alternative industries are compatible enough. How can we make sure that there are good, decent, unionized jobs available for uh, the people who currently rely on the fossil fuel industry, as well as uh, replace the contribution of the industry as a whole. Um, so in order to in order to answer that question, um, what we did was we did some economic modeling of scenarios for jobs in specifically in uh, certain uh, renewable energy sectors and in energy efficiency. Uh, and I will show you uh, some projections. Um, so what we looked at, um, and this is mostly because of uh, kind of relatively good levels of compatibility in terms of skills. We looked at uh, the wind power industry, we looked at marine, marine renewable in industry, and we looked at um, energy efficiency uh, retrofits. So there are three scenarios on this graph. Um, 
the current trajectory scenario uh, is about jobs that will come along um, on current policies, uh, mostly from the wind power sector, because at the moment there's not really enough support for tidal and um, uh, wave energy to really take off um, or for, uh, for energy efficiency retrofitting. Uh, the existing ambition scenario reflects kind of um, the some of the most ambitious things that are currently being proposed either by industry or by policymakers um, in relation to these industries. And then the fully renewable scenario is uh, the same thing but scaled up to uh, what the UK would actually need and actually in this case what Scotland would actually need um, to uh, to create enough uh, energy supply fully from renewable sources uh, by 2050. Uh, so we did, um, as this research is UK wide, um, uh, we we compiled a picture for all of England, Scotland, Wales, uh, Northern Ireland. But but this is th these are these are, are scenarios based specifically on proportions for Scotland. Um, the main thing to highlight from here is that the on, on current traje trajectory there is um, the, the number of uh, kind of stable jobs created is, is obviously a lot smaller um, uh, than on the other two. Uh, if uh, we go towards the more uh, ambitious scenarios, um, Scotland's, for example, Scotland's offshore wind resource uh, is absolutely huge. Only five um, gigawatts of offshore wind farms um, are currently operating or in in planning or in construction, whereas Scotland's um, overall resource is estimated as something around 46 gigawatts. So that gives you a, a kind of sense of sense of scale of how far these industries could really expand. And in um, if you compare uh, Scotland to um, England and Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, in other um, in other industries that we're studying here, so in uh, in onshore wind, in floating offshore wind, in um, in marine renewables, so tidal and wave, Scotland's actually got a much better um, a much better base, um, as well as uh, in some of the cases a much better resource. Um, so uh, so yeah, so 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 a lot of these jobs, um, if you look at Scotland compared to the rest of the UK, um, they'll be. A, a proportion of above 40% of jobs um, that we estimate uh, would be in, in Scotland or could be in Scotland. Um, so how do these scenarios compare to uh, the uh, numbers of oil and gas workers who may be affected by the transition? Um, this graph shows you in uh, orange the kind of solid line is the number of people who are currently working in this industry um, who may be affected. The dotted line is the um, is the overall kind of decrease in the number of, um, of oil and gas jobs. Uh, and then the, the three scenarios are represented by the other lines. Um, the main thing to say here is the current trajectory um, scenario does not Get, get us enough enough jobs. If if governments don't do anything uh, more than they're already doing, which is not very much, to support, um, for example, offshore wind uh, development, this will not create enough uh, jobs to kind of a, be able to envision a transition. Now, I should sort of put a caveat on that, uh, which is the um, uh, the most recent program for government uh, in Scotland uh, has elements of um support for um, offshore wind and, and um, infrastructure investment pots uh, that that we didn't count into this when we did the modeling so it may you know the current current trajectory might actually might actually be a bit further up than um, uh, than it is there on the graph um, but the main thing to highlight is that both the existing ambition scenario and the full renewable scenario mean that they're can be enough jobs to fully um, <coughs> replace the economic contribution of the oil and gas industry through renewable energy. Um, now, um, it's important to remember that this is not automatic. 
uh, these industries, like Greg alluded to at the beginning, um, to set up an industry really quickly to capture the benefits of uh, jobs and investment um, really required, as it did for the, for the oil and gas industry, uh, really required really active government support, really um, uh, a lot of incentives and a lot of thinking about how best to capture these benefits. So some of the ways that we see um, go uh, governments, both uh, Scottish and UK governments, being able to um, uh, support um, the, the clean energy uh, economy to set up um, in the way that will provide those jobs are listed here. Um, so some examples to highlight, um, of course, uh, you've got the Scottish National Investment Bank, which is p partly you know, planned for this, uh, for this purpose. Um, there are really successful examples, including in Germany and Canada, where um, a public bank is backing the transition and is making possible um, uh, the setup of, um, of clean energy industries. Um, another thing to uh, highlight is support for, um, uh, for the supply chains for the industries. Um, so lots of you will have heard of um, Bifab, a construction yard um, uh, up in Fife um, that um, has been struggling to uh, get uh, contracts for um, uh, building and supplying offshore uh, wind farms. Um, construction yards like that and, and uh, ports need a lot of upgrades in order to be able to bid for large contracts and that's something where um, uh, where government action and, and uh, investment and support could really uh, kind of make sure that those jobs arrive um, where where you'd want them. Um, and there's some support available already for oil and gas uh, supply chain companies um, uh, that want to move into uh, mm -hmm. renewable energy, for example, through Scottish Enterprise, but that's quite a limited that's quite a limited program of support. What we're talking about needs to be a lot more kind of holistic. Um, um, another opportunity is public energy companies. Um, of course, the Scottish government is committed to um, delivering a public energy company that focuses on energy supply to household by 2021. Um, the remit of that could be extended uh, to investing in the clean energy transition on the side of um, uh, on the side of generation as well. Um, uh, an example of how that can work really well is the uh, municipal energy company of uh, Munich in Germany, uh, which is actually, I think, the fifth largest um, uh, wind farm operator in all of Europe. And it not only is doing a really, really playing a really, really active part in the setup of that industry, but it's also um, giving the city of Munich um, something like a uh, hundred uh, million euro um, uh, dividend every year um, off of that. So, so something something like that could really could really work here. Um, and yeah, there there's plenty of other there's plenty of other examples that we can go into more detail with uh, later. Um, so this is how this is. This is how to set the industries up. But the other thing, uh, remember when I said, um, you know, that the oil industry is comparatively well organized through the trade unions. Um, uh, these are comparatively well paid jobs with good conditions, at least some of them. Um, now, to take an obvious example, the offshore wind industry, unfortunately, so far doesn't have that record. Um, we know that uh, workers on offshore wind farms are uh, finding it really difficult to unionize. We know that um, offshore wind farm developers sometimes and fairly often hire crews in um, uh, from abroad on uh, uh, sometimes on less than minimum wage um, and on really precarious conditions to uh, to come and build things. So um, if we're if we're really serious about saying okay. Uh, clean energy industries can provide alternative jobs, then we also need to think about the quality of these jobs and protecting uh, protecting the, the rights of the workers in them. Um, so we, in, in our report, um, uh, we sort of collated a set of safeguards that come from uh, demands made 
uh, by existing energy workers unions um, and in consultation with um, some people who work in them uh, for what might um, what might be uh, the kind of basics of protecting uh, workers' rights um, in in the context of a transition and making sure that, uh, in particular, people who are currently dependent on the oil and gas industry um, uh, get, a, uh, get a just transition. Um, so to um, to highlight some things very, uh, very, very briefly, um, there needs to be accountability. Trade unions need to be really actively involved in negotiating uh, transitions, um, as well as um, also local stakeholders. So local, um, for example, local governments and places that are most affected. Um, uh, governments should ensure um, job security for people who, whose jobs may be at risk. Um, and that means that if people have to retrain, if people have to um, uh, relocate, then those things should be um, should be paid for. Those things should be uh, free for the workers, and um, uh, retraining <coughs> retraining should be paid for. Um, wages and pe pensions ought to be protected. And here I note that actually quite a lot of the North Sea workforce that's kind of been subcontracted at the moment doesn't have access to secure pensions. So ideally, um, what we'd like to see is, is um, uh, pensions to be secure for those people as well. And of course, uh, trade union rights, rights to organize. Um, this needs to apply to the new sectors that are being built up through all the measures that I've um, that I've mentioned before. Um, now, uh, of course, um, the Just Transition Commission is something that is, is a statutory um, mechanism, uh, or not, not, not yet a statutory yeah. mechanism, <laughs> uh, but a mechanism set up by the Scottish Government uh, to, um, uh, to think through some of these questions and um, uh, one of the kind of uh, recommendations in our report is to put the, com the commission on a statutory basis um, uh, so that in the process of the transition, um, uh, just transition principles and just transition considerations are something that has to be at the centre of, um, of how different actors participate in it. Um, and I think that's, that's about it for me. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs>